Hello and welcome to online worship here for Dumblain Cathedral. May our time here together be a time of blessing and peace. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. His love is eternal. He has rescued you from your enemies and has brought you back from foreign countries, from east and west, from north and south. are full of hope and know God's affirming love. Come if your hearts are full of tears and be touched by God's healing love. Come whether it's your first or a hundredth time and be filled to overflowing with God's generous love. Come and see God's glory. Let's draw close with our prayers of adoration and confession. There is glory within each sunrise, Lord, a warm effusion of praise reaching upwards and out, connecting earth with heaven, creator with created, shafts of sunlight, arms outstretched in worship, Encourage participation from those who watch and wonder at the beauty of it all. Almighty and most wonderful God, unsearchable and inexhaustible, greater than we can ever imagine, higher than our highest thoughts, enthroned in glory and splendour, we come to give you our worship. We come to praise you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your kindness, and your forgiveness. Almighty and everlasting God, we come to speak, to listen, to seek, and to find. We come through the grace of Christ and in the power of your Holy Spirit, recognising you as our God, our Father, and our Creator, to make our confession, recognising that our ways are not your ways, 
and your thoughts are not our thoughts. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our narrow vision and closed minds when we have tried to tie you down to our own understanding, closing our hearts to anything which challenges our restricted horizons, losing sight of your greatness, fall at failing to listen to your voice or the voice of others, refusing to accept that others beside ourselves have insight to share. Lord, have mercy upon us. Almighty and most wonderful God, remind us that you have always more to say, more to reveal, and more to do. Open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to who and what you are. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, you call us as you called your disciples to follow you, not simply to believe, not merely to declare our faith and confess you as Lord, but you keep on following wherever you lead. Help us to follow in your footsteps, pursuing the way of love and accepting the road of sacrifice. Help us to follow you, letting your presence fill our hearts and trusting you so completely that your love shines through us. God and Jesus and Spirit of wholeness, as three and as one, shield us and save us, possess us and aid us, clear our path, go before our souls each step of the stormy world. We pray the words that Jesus himself taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 to 11, and then 31 to 49. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Soho, which belongs to Judah, and encamp between Soko and Azekah in Ephesdamim. Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath, of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. 
David said to Saul, let no one's hearts fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth, and if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from this hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armour. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armour and, the tri- and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadai and put them in his shepherd's bag. In the pouch, his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give you your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Amen.
Let us listen again for the word of God as contained in the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 4, reading from verses 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall blew up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Peace, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, guide my words and inspire our thinking, that our faith be strengthened, and love may grow anew within each one of us. Amen. You may remember the line from the hymn, Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils and snares we have already come. For many people, looking back on the past 15 months of pandemic, we may sense a little more clearly just what the hymn writer John Newton was on about. We have come through tough, challenging days and nights, and many people have been afraid. Afraid for their health or that of people they love. Afraid for the well-being of their children and their education. Afraid for their jobs or businesses. Who wouldn't be? There are times when we have felt, as the disciples must have felt, when their little boat was being pitched around in a sudden and unexpected storm, feeling that their little vessel would be swamped and they would all perish. And turning to our Old Testament reading about the story of David and Goliath, we may have felt that we were facing a hostile enemy, but one with a significant difference. For Goliath, as we know, was a huge warrior armed to the teeth, who was all too visible and weighed down with his kit, designed to impress and intimidate and probably because of it not able to move around very quickly at all, he had to have someone to carry his shield. The COVID-19 virus, our latter-day Goliath, has been all too invisible and able to transmit very quickly, which has been more threatening even still. And of course, it has something else in its armory, the capacity to mutate. Two readings. The first about two armies gathered for battle, with one parading its prize warrior Goliath, dressed to intimidate and daring anyone to take him on. The second about a small group of disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat as a fierce storm blew up, threatening their boat and therefore their lives. Although so different in context, there is at least one theme common to both. Sheer terror. Sheer terror in the face of a threat that seemed to be overwhelmingly strong. Both stories have a happy ending, except for Goliath, of course, and the Philistine army of which he was prize exhibit. The giant is defeated by a shepherd boy called David. The storm is calmed by Jesus, a descendant, we are told, of that same David. Jesus who describes himself as the Good Shepherd. Two tales about people surviving despite huge odds, a huge threat, may well be tales for these times. 
and especially perhaps for this particular Sunday, which has been designated as Sanctuary Sunday, as we think of and pray for those who have no place to call home, no place that it can guard us happy and secure. It takes on a particular poignancy as we think of those who, out of sheer desperation for a better and safer life, try to cross seas and flimsy boats, which are often overloaded. And even if they get to their destination, which tragically many do not, they're met with a state that doesn't want them, a state that is armed with bewildering bureaucracy in a language most of these refugees don't understand. I can never now read the story of terrified disciples in the midst of a storm without recalling the picture that shocked so many of us, that of the lifeless body of three-year-old Alan Kurdi, a boy of Kurdish, Kurdish origin from Syria, lying on a beach. He had drowned as he and his family tried to flee to the west in a small, small rubber dinghy. Unless we try to turn this reading from Mark's gospel into a nice tale about Jesus calming storms and all being well, we surely have to be honest enough to acknowledge that there was no calming of the storm for him or his family, or indeed for many others. And we perhaps have to be honest enough to admit that we, and many others have done just what the disciples of Jesus did when being tossed around in that boat, crying out to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? With both of these tales, we have to dig a bit deeper. First, with regard to the tale of David and Goliath from our Old Testament reading, there is something about the story that appeals to many of us. The small man talk, taking on the big man and prevailing against all the odds. The individual or fragile community that takes on the big multinationals and prevails. I think of a Swedish teenager, Greta Thunberg, who has made world leaders sit up and listen to what she has to say about the need for urgent action on climate change, and who is now included in the Times list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Stories of the so-called small person, a latter-day David taking on the Goliaths of this age and prevailing despite being much less adequately equipped or resourced, may well give us heart when we feel as we are among the small people. However, so often, although we may admire the small person in the tale, David, we strive to be Goliath. Why do we need to spend so much time trying so hard to be Goliath? We think it's quaint and clever that David got by with five smooth stones and a sling, but we spend our energies and our resources building up our latter-day supply of swords and spears and javelins. We clad our cars and our houses and our country to look like Goliath with so many safety and security features. We can hardly move around in them. For generations, many mainstream churches, including the Church of Scotland, I fear, whilst admiring David, have striven to be like Goliath. Proud that we have the largest membership, the biggest financial reserves, the most buildings, and so on. We have expected a seat at the top table in so many areas of community and national life used to describe our General Assembly as the closest thing Scotland had to a Parliament of its own. Those days are past now, not simply because we do have a Scottish Parliament, but in the most recent General Assembly, tough decisions were made. A reduction in the number of full-time ministers to 600, a reduction in the number of buildings we can possess what we do possess and can no longer afford to maintain. Yes, it will be painful to face those challenges as a denomination. It will be painful for us here in Dumbling Cathedral when Dorothy Anderson retires at the end of this month, 
moving from two full-time ministers to one. But painful most of all because we simply will miss Dorothy as a minister, pastor and friend. It is painful to discover that you're not the Goliath you wanted to be. The church has tried to be a Goliath rather than a David. We once had a member of this congregation, now gone to glory, who complained at one point that ministers of Dunblane Cathedral were shorter than they used to be. A taller minister was surely, in her view, so much more in keeping with the place. She wanted a Goliath rather than a David. Yet, is all this as bad as we tend to think it is? I dare to believe that approached in the right spirit and with humility, imagination and faith, these can be exciting times for the church at large as we become leaner, more flexible and perhaps humbler and more accessible. Like David, we don't need to don armour that matched what Goliath had or what our forefathers had. But we need to recognise the value of what we do have to hand, the gifts of the people in our midst, the gifts of the people of this and many communities that they would be bring, willing to bring if we only thought to ask and to encourage them. Writing over a decade ago when in the United States, the Reverend Sam Wells, now of St Martin in the Fields in London, asked this, why are mainline denominations feeling such a creeping sense of panic in this country right now? Because they're facing numerical decline. Why is that a problem? After all, Christianity isn't any less true just because it is less widely believed. The reason it's a problem is that mainline denominations have assumed for as long as anybody can remember that they're supposed to be Goliaths. They're supposed to be huge. They're supposed to be important. They're supposed to be players in the national stage. They're supposed to be the acknowledged voice of the people. All the things that Goliath was. All the things that David wasn't. The element, the other element that links these two very different tales together is faith. Faith in God in the midst of what shakes and even terrifies us. Back to the second reading, reading from Mark. I don't know what you make of Mark's account of the calming of the storm. Is it literal truth or something that calls for a rational explanation? For to regard it only in a literal way, that Jesus really did command the wind and the waves to be still, can raise as many questions as it addresses. It is is that the only sort of storm that he stills? Does it have any relevance for us today? Especially for those of us who rarely, if ever, step on a boat. And what of the many storms at sea or wherever that God or Jesus simply have not stilled? But the so-called rational explanation to which others adhere that the storm just happened to die down at the very moment that Jesus spoke is hardly satisfactory either. Does that not cast Jesus into the role of a con man who uses the sudden calming of the storm, which can and does happen in the Sea of Galilee due to the geography of the place, as a way of convincing the disciples that he has great power? We should not subject such an account as this to the limits and norms of our own times or simply our own understanding. For that not only diminishes God in our eyes and blunts our understanding, missing the symbolic value and subtlety of what Mark and other gospel writers have to tell us. In the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, the sea is regarded as a place to be feared and a place of God's continuing struggle with the forces of chaos and evil place of primal struggle. The ability to control the sea was regarded as a sign of God's divine power, whereas the human ability to remain calm was seen as a sign of true faith. In this story, Jesus is true to his calling, 
in bringing the presence of God even into the midst of a storm. And all that is asked of the disciples is a calm faith. But they are found wanting. Have you still no faith? Back to John Newton, through many dangers, toils and snares, we have already come. And we have come through stormy waters and faced the considerable threat that is COVID-19 in these past months. We've all had our moments of panic. And many of us have even cried out to God, do you not care that we are perishing? Like those who faced Goliath, we have felt very small and vulnerable in the face of this threat that is so small that the human eye, the naked eye, cannot see it. Yet the challenge is to have faith. God is with us. Christ is still in the boat, his authority undiminished. Our calling is to have faith, even if it is a fragile faith at times. It is not wrong to feel vulnerable or afraid. What we are not called to do is to strive to be like Goliath. But any desire that we may have to become like him is a sign, ultimately, that we've lost faith in God and lost sight of who God really is, putting our trust in human things instead. The real power I am convinced that transforms this world for good is the power that Christ himself displayed. The power of humility, truth, trust, trust in God, service, self-giving, and above all else, the power of utter love. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the peace of this sanctuary, we come before you, God who cares for us as a father, strong, unyielding, ageless. In the tranquility of our homes, we come before you, God who mothers us with gentleness, compassion and understanding, with thankful hearts, for the unity of God, the three in one, neither male nor female, defying description, but who lived among us in sonship and lives within us still in the animating force of the spirit, we offer our prayers to the one whose likeness, despite our diversity, we all share. For the country we call home, where we can live in peace, for the rule of law which keeps us safe and both protects and limits our freedoms. For the rights of suffrage which enable democracy and the entitlements we have to education, health care and justice, we come with thankful hearts. But these liberties which we acknowledge are often also things we take for granted. Despite the evidence all around us, which should awaken our senses to the plight and desperation of so many people who are denied even the most basic of human rights. On this Sanctuary Sunday, help us to lift our eyes beyond the beauty of this space, to see beyond the familiarity of our homes, and to notice, really notice, the asylum seekers and refugees in our midst, those who have braved the storms of life, which have disturbed their hearts and minds and souls, so that the best option is the dangerous and difficult journey on stormy waves and in cramped conditions. Those who have found the courage to leave behind the familiar to embrace the new, be that a new country, culture and language, or a new start following an abusive relationship or addiction. God of tenderness and strength, help us to look as if seeing with your eyes and to have the courage to face up to the forces which threaten disaster. So that not only will we see the refugees, 
we will also be ready to act for and with them, to offer hospitality and welcome, friendship and appropriate help. With gladness we offer our thanks for the life and example of your Son, Jesus Christ, a calming presence amidst the storms, a powerful presence when all seems lost, and by whose death and resurrection we have the reassurance of life in fullness which awaits us in the next dimension. Because he lived our lives, he learned of the highs and lows, the peaks and troughs of human experience. And so we give you thanks that even when we have not acknowledged his presence, he has been beside us as we have negotiated the choppy waters of the COVID-19 pandemic and is with us still. That even when we doubted or accused him of not caring about us, his love has been unending and his care has been all-encompassing. With confidence in that enduring love and care, we bring you our prayers for those who are in need or in our thoughts. People who are ill, whether with physical or mental ill health, or for, and for whom these times cause added strain. People who are finding it increasingly difficult to manage even the routine tasks of daily life, and think that they are a burden on those who must now care for them. People preparing to step over the threshold of death into life in your nearer presence. And all who mourn, whether their loss is recent or distant, but who still struggle with the absence caused by the loss of a loved one. For the faith of those who have gone before us and who now enjoy the sanctuary of heaven, we give you our thanks, three in one God, our creative Father, compassionate Son, and cajoling Spirit. Amen.
May God give you the strength to face any giant. May God persuade you to meet them with grace. And may what no longer fits be left behind. Your armour being rather <clears throat> that of truth and love. And the blessing of God, Creator, Son and Holy Spirit, sustain you and rest upon you and all you remember and love, now and always. Oh, oh, oh.